thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink, thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own, into our house enter thou not, through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hey, Dan. It's me. Hi, Lindsay. Hi. Yeah, that's right. You You're know Lindsay. my name. Oh, I my, remembered. That is impressive. <laughs> uh, couple cool announcements, and then we're into lots of horror. Uh, very, very cool Scared to Death podcast, Heartbreaker, Black Tea and Hoodie in the BadMagicMerch.com store. Uh, one of the many super cool horror and paranormal themed designs in the best podcast store on the web. I, we Our merch store is, mm-hmm. I, I would love to see another podcast. I know, we're biased. We're biased, but if this store belonged to another podcast, I would 100% be jealous. I'd be like, oh my God, how do you do that? Yay, so good job, Yay. Logan. Thanks, Lo. And then very excited to announce that tickets are on sale now as this episode comes out for the first annual Scared to Death Live Haunted Halloween True Tales of Hallow's Eve Horror. Aye, aye, aye. Uh, you can get your tickets now for this Moment House digital experience at badmagicmerch.com. The show is happening Thursday, October 28th, 6 p.m. Pacific Time, 9, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. There will be a live chat room for those watching in real time on the 28th. And then you'll be able to rewatch it or if you can't make it, watch it for the first time through Halloween night. Oh, nice. So through the rest of October. And there will be some additional bells and whistles I'll announce when it gets closer. Yeah. Uh, much like our previous La Llorona live show, these stories will never be told on a regular Tuesday night episode. That's right. Or on one of the Patreon episodes. You can only hear them at this Moment House digital experience on the 28th. Uh, this year, I'll be telling three stories that have all taken place on Halloween night. Uh, okay. This is the first Lindsay's hearing about them. The first takes place at a Halloween party in 1973, where the scariest guest at the party, not someone wearing a costume. Second story set in 1985, when two extra spooky trick-or-treaters show up at someone's door. Oh my god, that makes me think Black Eyed Children. The third is The Legend of Murder Creek. Halloween night, 1890, just outside the little town of Akron, New York, very troubled 17-year-old Sadie McMullen throws two little girls off a railroad bridge. What? Into the small brook that will then be known as Murder Creek. The nine-year-old dies ever since the angry, vengeful spirit of Nellie Connor, rumored to show herself late on Halloween night. Okay. Lindsay, of course, will be sharing more fantastic fan-submitted horror, so many spoops. I'm going to look and see if I can, if anyone has stories that they've submitted that are Halloween. I'm going to mm-hmm. do a... Halloween theme. I'm going to do a command F and so, see what I can find. <laughs> <laughs> so again, go to badmagicmerch.com. Get your tickets to this Moment House digital experience, October 28th, uh, Scared to Death Live Haunted Halloween, True Tales of Hallow's Eve Horror, uh, and limited edition merch for this event now oh available. God. Okay, should we show off the merch? Because yeah. it's like, <gasps> it's so good. And you don't have, you know, like... Mm-hmm. You don't have to worry that like you, oh my God, I can't like get the shirt the day of the show, the, Mm -hmm. or, you know, I I missed it. What I'm trying to say is I had too much coffee today. Oh my God, I forgot to order a shirt. It's the day of the show. The merch will be available until the close of the replay, which is after Halloween. So like November 1st, this merch isn't going to be available. Yep. The 31st of October is your last day to get it. Just like, I know how my brain is. I'm like, oh, I'll get it later. Oh, I need to like put some money aside for that. So you can space it out. But- once it's gone, it is gone. Very cool stuff. Like this is the logo for the uh, the haunted Halloween show we're doing. Yeah, I love it. This is my favorite one. It comes mm-hmm. in a hoodie and a t-shirt. Mm-hmm. It just says horror. Are you calling me names? <laughs> I know. I love that it sounds so I, close. Oh, I love it. I, I'm gonna wear it so much. That is my favorite one. Mm-hmm. Just so many cool designs. And uno mas. So we're Check we're very we're very excited. We one. hope to make this an annual tradition. Check out this guy here. Awesome. So weird. So much cool merch. Thanks again to Logan. Mm-hmm. Just really busting out so much good stuff for us and knocking it out of the park. Yes. And I'm just going to throw it on the floor. <laughs> so now we'll get into our show. Okay. Um, how much horror do you have for us today? I have two bits of horror. Two bits of horror. I actually have three bits today. Oh, well, that's nice. That's a good balance. Mm-hmm. The rare three show, uh, three story day for me. Um, the first two, you brought up these entities a second ago. We haven't talked about them no. for a while. Yeah. Two black eyed creature stories. Black eyed creatures. One tale of black eyed kids. One is uh, 
what may be the same entity, similar entity, but in adult form. Oh, okay. And black, then I, black eyed grown up. <laughs> and then I have one demonic transference or transference. What does Trans- that mean? Like transfer, transference, transference, oh. transference slash demonic infestation story. It'll make sense when we get into the story while I'm why I'm labeling it that way. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have a story that we're going to go to Asia for. Okay. Uh, fan story, obviously. Uh, like a weird premonition. I don't even know if that's the right word. Like a weird ghost sighting that is a foretelling of something. Okay. That is really like, I don't know, if I was this person, I think I'd still be messed up from it, which it sounds like it still kind of affects their day-to-day life. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other one, oh yeah. You know that feeling when you're like walking up the basement stairs and you're like, oh God, oh God, oh God. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. This story is going to intensify that feeling by about a million Okay. and confirm that you've been right. Every time you've had that feeling of like, I think there's something watching me. Probably. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Ichiwawa. <laughs> Ichiwawa. That's like uh, our new favorite thing. Are you are you ready to begin? Um, I am. I have on these so cute, so cute little puppy dog socks. Joe, get my leg. Woo! Giving you guys a show. I can't. Uh, there they are. Puppy dog. Cute. Very cute. I gotta stop wearing dresses on this show. <laughs> uh, average amount of setup for this first one. So, so like I mentioned kind of earlier, it has been a while since we talked about black-eyed kids here on Scared to Death. I, I feel like we went pretty heavy on them the first few months of the podcast. Got Lindsay good and scared. Uh-huh. Then we kind of pumped the brakes on black-eyed kid encounters. Uh, but they do continue to intrigue us. And when we find new stories, they tend to terrify us. And we have, yeah, two new short tales today. I hope they scare some listeners, get some peepers good and freaked out. No one really knows what these things are. Are they demonic entities, aliens, cryptids? Something else altogether. Just creepy ass kids. Typically, uh, black eyed children encounter stories involved, yeah, two kids, often a boy and a girl between the ages of around six and 16, who either knock on a door or approach a vehicle. And, you know, one of the hallmarks is they demand to be let in. Uh, most people manage to keep them from entering, they don't invite them. Uh, these two stories are not about that, though. These are a little bit different. One involves a black eyed kid attacking out in the open without asking for permission. Mm. And then the other is an example of, yeah, a black eyed entity in an adult human form who also doesn't seem to need anyone's permission to do what they seem to like to do. So together, these tales just offer us a bit more to think about when it comes to these entities. Okay, just fleshing it out. Great. So first one, Jamal had turned just 13 years old. He was a good kid, a little bit rebellious, uh, but nothing too serious. He fancied himself as a a dark and mysterious type (laughs) and tough. When he grew up, he wanted to be either some type of special forces soldier or a detective. Cool. And on the night of the supposed encounter, he kind of lied to his mom and told her he was headed off to a friend's house to stay the night. He was doing that, but he was going to take a few hours to get there. First, he wanted to wander around the neighborhood on his own doing these little solo patrols he liked to do. Practice for when he was, you know, maybe a cop or a soldier someday for when he'd be paid to be tough and brave, and then he would crash at his friend's house. Time now for the tale of They Came From The Woods. It was a crisp, cool night, but not overly cold. Jamal managed to stay comfortable in just a hoodie. And being out for a half hour or so, he was, uh, or after being out for a half hour or so, he was surprised by how unusually quiet the streets were. Yes, it was one o'clock in the morning, but it was also a, a Friday night, and usually there'd be at least a few other people out but he didn't see anyone. He was doing a big circle of the neighborhood he'd done numerous times before, walking around in the dark, half lost in his thoughts, when he suddenly saw two kids emerging from the woods that bordered his neighborhood a little further down the road. He was surprised they were out. He was young, uh, but they looked so young. He didn't think they could be any older than eight or nine. Boy and a girl. And even though it wasn't real cold, they definitely weren't dressed for the weather, just shorts and t-shirts. Jamal decided to follow them, see what they were up to, staying a little behind. What on earth were two nine-year-olds doing out on their own in the woods past midnight? He decided to keep an eye on them, and he followed them further down the road, making sure he didn't bring any attention to himself. He racked his brain, trying to figure out who they were. It was a small neighborhood, one of those places where most everybody knew each other, but Jamal was sure he had never seen them before. They didn't seem lost or scared. They seemed to know where they were going. They were walking without hesitation, weren't talking to one another. Then the boy suddenly came to a halt at the edge of the street at an intersection. The little girl then carried on walking until she was out in the middle of the road. Then she turned to look at the boy. When out of nowhere, Jamal saw a truck turning a corner onto the stretch of road where the little girl was standing. It was moving real fast. And if she didn't get out of the street, he didn't think the driver would see her in time to stop. She made no attempt to move, just kept standing there. Jamal yelled, watch out! 
and she didn't react. So Jamal sprinted over to where the girl was as fast as his legs could carry him. He grabbed her, dragged her to the other side of the street, and they narrowly missed getting hit. The truck honked its horn. The driver yelled something, drove off. Jamal tried to catch his breath. He asked the girl if she was okay, and she didn't say anything. Instinctively, he could tell she was angry. Why? Pretty strange reaction considering he had just saved her life. While he looked at her, the light from a street lamp shone down and hit her eyes, and Jamal suddenly froze. Staring back at him were a pair of black, inhuman eyes, the blackest black he'd ever seen. He hated the way those eyes made him feel. As he stared into them, he felt as if they were feeding on his soul. He almost felt hypnotized. And then the trance-like state he was in was broken when the boy grabbed his arm. So much power in his grip. For a nine-year-old, he had the strength of a very strong, full-grown man, and Jamal could feel his arm bruising under this powerful grip. The strange boy then began to pull Jamal away from the girl over towards the woods, and the boy had the same black and terrifying eyes. Jamal tried to break away and run, but he couldn't escape the boy's vice-like grip. He continued to struggle, first in shocked silence, then he finally found his voice that seemingly been scared out of him, and he started to scream. When he began to scream, the black-eyed boy's hand slipped, and now he was only holding Jamal's sleeve. Jamal immediately ducked down, pulled himself out of his hoodie, and ran, leaving the boy holding only his clothing. After standing confused for a second, the two scary children, or whatever they were, gave chase, shouting after Jamal in robotic, not quite human voices for him to stop. Jamal ran towards his friend's house, but worried that they would follow him and find him there and do God knows what, he backtracked, tried to lose them, running around in circles until he thought he was safe. It worked. Pretty soon, they were nowhere to be found, and then he ran straight to his friend's house, exhausted and scared, but alive, and with quite the story to tell. He snuck out of someone's house at one o'clock in the morning? I know, late at night to go to the sleepover. Who knows what was going on? Well, no, he was at the sleepover. No, 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 he was was going to the sleepover. So he just lies to his mom and leaves the house? Mm -hmm. That part, I'm sorry, I got so hung up on that part as a parent, where I was like, uh, Monroe's 13. Right. Um, she's not walking her happy ass to a sleepover. I am taking her. <laughs> I know. And then it's like a text or a phone call, like, because like at her yeah. mom's house, like she'll go to her sure. other friends just down the street, but right. there's still like a text, like, Hey, I made it. And then like the parent, the parental communication. Yeah. Of, like, like if Monroe was having a sleepover with one of her friends, even Kyler, yeah. like, and, uh, the kid didn't show up. As the parent on the receiving end of, and the host, yeah. I would be calling the other parent, like, Hey, Karen. Uh, sure, sure. Jimmy never showed up. Yeah, very so, much more relaxed here in these households. Oh, I did not like that part. That really like made my mama bear come out. And <laughs> yeah. then I'm like, you fucking idiot. What are you doing out at one in the morning? Doing I, his patrols. But I, I was never that brave. Would you have gone out at one o'clock in the morning? Maybe it's like a boy thing. Because I well, mean, that actually, mentality of like. Yes. I mean, I did in a way think it was cute, though, that he like wants to mm-hmm, practice. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's a boy thing. We snuck out like um, when I was in junior high. So about the same age. Um, I don't know. Yeah. 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 But yeah, same age. Um, we would, st- I mean, I, it wasn't about telling my mom I was going to a sleepover. I wouldn't yeah. have been allowed to like walk out of the house late at night. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, me and Kyler Wilson, I think it was mostly just the two of us. We would sneak out of my window when he'd come over for a sleepover, you know, around midnight, one in the morning. Yeah. And then we would just, <laughs> so ridiculous looking back, we would dress all in black. Oh my God. And we'd take black t-shirts and like Oh, like a ninja, like make him into like a ninja mask over our face. So just our <laughs> eyes to like make us. Uh-huh. Even. And then we would just wander around town, just like being kids out in the middle of the night, just checking things out. Sometimes we do little mischievous things like um, the signs for some of the motels there. Yeah. Were these old, like on the ground signs uh-huh. out in front by uh-huh. the road. And they had those little letters that could pop out and pop so you could rearrange things. And we would just like change things around to say different things on their signs. Probably like obscene things. Oh, of course. Like cuss words and. Low yeah. job or whatever. Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. And then, and then we would just hide in the bushes, sneak over to the school. We we didn't really do anything of consequence. We just liked being out and sneaking around. Okay, okay. I guess mm-hmm. I don't understand that mentality. Yeah, I don't know if that's like a little boy thing, but okay, that actually is quite helpful to hear. Because I was like, what? Who, who has the desire to do that? Yeah. Um, because I would be so scared. At least you were with Kyler. Right. This kid well, is by alone. himself. That is fucking terrifying. Yes. I get afraid driving a car home in the dark by myself, okay? And, right. and I'm, you know. Yeah, his, his parents, whatever, seem a little more relaxed. Or well, mom. and he's relaxed. Yeah. Oh, yeah, as yeah. As far as to let him out that late to wander over to another kid's house to go over to their house that late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. thought that was a little odd, too, but that's what they uh, that's what they claimed. Yeah, yeah. Oh, just so creepy, though, to mm-hmm. think about some little things popping out of the woods. Mm-hmm. Middle of the night, 
just some like suburban neighborhood or whatever, and some little kids just wander out of the woods. Oh my God. I mean, that freaks Not really me. talking to each other, just mm-hmm. no, walking I, with purpose. For all the times I've been home, whether someone else is home with me or not, that the dogs suddenly catch a whiff of something and uh-huh. they suddenly need to go outside and patrol the yard and then they're barking like crazy or you think you hear something. Right. You know, it's like we can hear cars go by in our street and I'll be like, was that a car? Was that not? So to think oh, like man. the thought of going to check and then seeing something come out of the woods. Yeah. Imagine like flip flipping on your um, no, back no, porch no, lights. No, no, And two two little kids are standing out uh, on the back back deck on the concrete slab. Yeah. Just black eyes staring on into the, the house. On the concrete slab. On our patio? I would think a patio being wood, but I guess it is called a patio, huh? Patios aren't wood. They're not? That's a gazebo maybe you're thinking of. Mm-hmm. A deck, deck is wood. So that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. So patio is concrete. Pa- okay. So standing out on the patio. <laughs> concrete slab is just like, you know, a block of concrete. Yeah. <laughs> very very technical terms here um yeah i actually have had that thought many mm-hmm. a times especially it seems like those thoughts really come when you're by yourself yeah so like if you're working late at the studio and i'm at home and the dogs suddenly again suddenly need to go out i get in the i get the most nervous when i have to let them back in yeah and i'm like okay i have to open this door because i have to let the dogs in what could it be yeah what could be out there mm-hmm. i've put up lots of locks on our gates now so that's good yeah, I know. Uh, yep, yeah, I know. I, I... Listen, I've lost my mind. There's a lot of locks now. <laughs> a lot of locks now. A lot of locks. Yeah. Uh, this. Uh, no photos to accompany that story. I, I, yeah, I do. I, I, oh. I was going to show you a photo. So this first first picture, black eyed entity. Uh, they never have any. The stories never have the pictures attacked or attached. Right. So this is just one I found online. Is that, that from uh, a movie? Uh, I don't know. It might be. I, I couldn't figure out. A lot of these images, it's so hard to find out where they come from initially. Mm-hmm. Um, I just thought this one was creepy. And then this She's next, cute. She's a cute kid. <laughs> cute kid, yeah, with the dark eyes. And then there's another one is, uh, this is a photoshopped one, obviously, but uh, just thought they did a good job. Found it on Pinterest. Is that a baby picture of Momo? I know. Yeah, a little Momo, baby Momo-esque. Momo. Just the angry face. Mm-hmm. She would get so mad. So I got distracted for a second. I was like, oh, yeah, that lock. I was like, why did you pick that one kind of lock? Okay, I'm, I ordered new ones. because. Okay, good. Okay, I ordered this lock. I thought it was so smart of me. You run it through an app, and it is digital with your thumbprint, yeah. and I didn't add Dan to it. Right. And then also, you have to charge the lock. Oh, my God. Uh, I know. I, I already p- uh, pictured myself getting bolt cutters mm-hmm. to have for the inevitable moment where I'm like by myself or whatever, and that lock just won't open, and I just take the bolt cutters and just cut it off. I love that also, it's not like that's the only way I know, that but you I, could. But I would still just want to do that. Just, I'd be annoyed, and I just want to get rid of it because it bothers me. <laughs> this is our life. You yep. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is a lot of couples' lives. Mostly uh, us, I think. <laughs> are you are you ready for another short uh, black eyed uh, entity encounter? Dude, could you tell I was stalling a little bit? I don't want any more. <laughs> no setup at all in this one. We just get right into it. Time now for the tale of worry not. Ryan was once a bartender in Manhattan. Over the years, he'd come across more than his fair share of oddballs and eccentrics of people who were just a little bit different. Most were forgettable, but a few he'd remember for the rest of his life. One in particular, the most memorable by far one he wanted to forget. He saw and served this man many, many times, but he never got his name. Ryan had always thought he was probably in his 50s or 60s, but who knows? Maybe he was 50, maybe he was 100, maybe he's a 1,000. He now wonders how long this person, or whatever he is, has truly been around. This mysterious man has always walked, or always walked with a cane, no limp, bit hunched over, moved with an air of dignity and of purpose. The man always wore the same worn black trench coat, no matter the weather, no matter if he were indoors or out, and he always wore sunglasses as well. He was a easy customer, if not, if you know, if odd. He never failed to be polite, and Ryan grew increasingly fascinated by him each time he came in. Also more and more uneasy. While he never seemed to do anything to bother anyone, there was something instinctively repulsive about the man. Getting near him at the bar felt like approaching a predator at the zoo. You knew it was highly unlikely that the lion or the cobra would be able to get out of its pen so you should feel safe, but still on a cellular level or something, your body just, you know, doesn't want to be that close to something that could easily kill you. And you feel that survival instinct sitting tensely in the pit of your stomach. Ryan couldn't recall how many times he'd fetched this man the same drink, a vodka martini, and then after talking to him about nothing of importance the first few times he came in, He began to always hurry off and find an excuse, any excuse, to busy himself with something else to do until the man needed another drink. Ryan noticed over the several months that the guy was coming in, the customers seemed to always have one 
of two reactions to him. He seemed to make the majority feel a little uncomfortable and creeped out. After they sat next to him, they'd make their escape as soon as they could possibly do so without looking overly rude. But some customers were immediately very intrigued by him, and they'd sit and talk with him for hours. Finally, on the last night Ryan would ever see this man, he caught himself thinking about how all the people he'd seen talk to this man, all the ones who were intrigued by him, he'd never seen a single one of them again. This was New York, so it wasn't uncommon to have customers that only popped in the one time, but now that he thought about it, a few of those people had been regulars. The last night he'd stopped by, the strange man walked into the bar like usual, took his favorite bar stool. Then while Ryan made sure he was having his usual drink, he saw that the man's eyes seemed to be bothering him, and he took his sunglasses off and placed them on the bar for a moment, moment in order to rub the corner of one of them. Ryan now saw his eyes for the very first time, and when he did, he couldn't help but take an uncomfortable step back. Ryan had seen a lot over the years in New York. He'd seen sick people, drug addicts, drunks, all kinds of severely mentally ill people. He'd seen people in all kinds of elaborate costumes with contacts even that made their eyes look all sorts of crazy, but nothing like this. When Ryan looked into this man's eyes, they were the purest, darkest black he'd ever seen. The kind of black you might see if you looked down into the deepest of holes, trying to find the bottom. His eyes had no pupil, no iris, just nothing but darkness. Ryan quickly looked away, afraid that maybe he'd seen something he shouldn't have. And then the man put his sunglasses on, and he spoke to Ryan in a low voice, barely over a whisper. He just said, Worry not. I already have all that I need. And then he turned and walked slowly out of the bar, and Ryan never saw him again. What does that mean? Like, I'm not going to take you? I guess so. Never did take him. I already have all that I need. He got what he was hunting for from that place, I guess. Wow. Oh, I have full body chills. Oh, yeah? It's just so creepy. Just some some person. I mean, it sounds like, you know, like from the way Ryan's telling the story that this yeah. person just came in there like a predator. Mm-hmm. Or, it reminds me of like, um, I don't even know what these things are called, but like certain creatures on the bottom of the ocean floor that will like, like little eels and things mm-hmm. that will just, they just lay in wait. Bottom feeders? Little bottom, well, kind of, not bottom feeders in the sense like a, a, a sucker fish or anything, but they're hiding in like a, in the rocks or whatever. Mm. And when the right kind of prey floats past them, they mm-hmm. just pop out of nowhere, grab them and pull them back in. But they don't like chase their prey. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, they, they wait for it to come to them. And it sounds like that's the, that's the way this thing was hunting. I found it especially creepy because when you are a bartender, mm-hmm. you are trapped behind the oh, bar. Oh, yeah. You cannot go anywhere. Yeah, and, and you can't just, uh, you know, unless you own the bar, yeah. you can't just toss customers out for skeeving you out a little bit if they're right. not doing anything blatantly wrong. And even then, I mean, I know that the owner has the right to refuse service, but yeah. under on, on what grounds would you be kicking this guy out? Hey, buddy, you make me a, a wee bit uncomfortable. Yeah, you make my stomach feel weird. Ugh. Get out of here. Last night, I was making zucchini bread, Mm -hmm. and I found out that Monroe had used up all of the baking powder and left me with none, but Uh, put the empty container back in the frickin' cupboard. I'm sure that drives you, yeah. Bonkers. Uh So I was like, okay, I'll run down to the store. I went to one store, randomly. Out of baking powder? Of all the things. Alex and I went to the Safeway on 4th, if you guys live in CDA, you know. Wow, there are a cast of characters at that store at, at nine night. o'clock at night. Shout out, by the way, to one of the checkers at that store. Um, she is a big fan of Scared to Death. Oh, God, yeah. her And her husband's a big fan of yours. Mm-hmm. Oh, I can picture exactly mm-hmm. what she looks like. What is her name? I took a picture with her last time we were in there. That's not Kim. Oh, God Well, bless. you know who you're t- we're talking about. Uh, uh, so. I know. I'm like, I can picture you. I know mm-hmm. who you are. We were at that yeah. Safeway twice in one week. And she was like, I can't believe you're back. Yeah. We have friends over at Pilgrim's. We have that cute little oh, yeah. engaged couple that work at mm-hmm. the deli. Not far from that Safeway, um, yeah. But anyways, there was this guy at that store that yeah. was like, they just made me think that. I'm like, they can't ask him to leave. Right. He's not doing anything wrong. But he is Creepy. creepy I walked I was like trying to find the right aisle you know when it's not yeah. your regular store you're like god where is that and he goes hello and just smiled at me and I was like oh my god <laughs> get away from me <laughs> I was like quickly do what I need to do I got uh-huh. out as fast as I could I'm walking to the car like uh, uh. but it, they can't kick yeah. him out he wasn't doing anything wrong he was just fucking creepy I mean, it makes me think of uh, I've been watching the most recent season of American Horror Story like last night in bed that's what I was watching by myself um, well, you don't always want to watch that show. How rude. It's the alien one, right? Nope. Like, the, it's a, it's, the vampire? Nope. It's a, Oh, then it's not the most recent. Oh, well, the most recent one on Netflix. Mm. It's called like 1984, I think. Yeah, it, it's supposed to be vampires and then aliens, and then they like are going to meet up. Oh, I know which one you're talking about, and no, it's not. Because oh. I've, I've watched half of it already, and it's absolutely not about that. Huh. 
uh, unless it morphs. Okay. Uh, substantially. Okay. But Richard Ramirez is a character in it. Ooh. And, and he was just that guy, like, serial killer who just put out such a creepy vibe. Mm-hmm. Like, like a lot of, like, serial killers can, like, hide in plain sight. Right. And and you're like, oh, it seems like uh, we're so shocked. I don't think anyone was shocked that who knew him when he was caught. It was like, oh, my God, of course. Of course he was. Such a fucking creepy dude. I immediately am thinking of some kids in Monroe's class. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> uh, no pictures with this story either. Um, I did search for a creepy guy at the bar. <laughs> What'd and, you get? And I came across this meme and just thought it was pretty funny. Oh my gosh. Who needs Facebook or Twitter because I'm already following you? And just some dude making a super weird facial expression. I know. <laughs> he looks like Ellie Bird a little bit. He does. Looks like our, our, niece. our niece makes the <laughs> funniest faces. And then uh, I had to find at least one spooky pick. Uh, this comes up on a variety of sites when you just search for black eyed man. Oh. So creepy Photoshop, but yeah, not bad. Uh, it is so, so creepy because it's the whole eye. Mm-hmm. I know. And some people will get it, uh, their eyes tattooed this way. I can't even think what you it call it. It sounds so the painful. Ink, yeah, and the ink added. I don't, I guess it's not from what I've heard, but, um. That's weird because when I poke myself in the eye, it hurts like a mofo. Uh, right. Maybe they just, the way they numb it or something, but, but when they add that ink, it's like, you know, whatever, if that's what you want to do, like Yeah, RT-wise. like your body mod, yeah. But you, you have to understand you're going to skeeve out a good, I don't know, 50, 60, 70% of the population the rest of your life. But isn't that the reason why you're doing it? True, you, true. I think that if, when if you, you do you that, you're looking for a reaction. Yeah, you're looking for a reaction. If, if you do that, <laughs> and then you're Or like, you at least have to be smart enough. If you're not doing it, because I yeah. do want to like caveat that with like, yeah. yeah, you're doing it for yourself and that's fine. Sure. And if you're self-aware enough yeah. to be doing that and knowing like, this is for me, I've made this decision. Yeah. You're probably also aware enough that the world is going to have something to say about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Like if you do that and then you go apply to the day, uh, like a daycare the next week to work, and you're shocked <laughs> that, that they don't have a good reaction to you, oh my God. then you're just not self-aware. I like, re- you don't oh. have a good sense of how reality is. I want somebody to have a job at a daycare with black eyes, and I want to hear. I wonder what the kids would say. <laughs> I mean, maybe someday it'll normalize more. You know, become more mainstream. But yeah, but it just because it's it is just. Um, it's you just know, shocking. It's so different it's than what we know. Yeah, yeah. And it's associated with horror, specifically that look. Yeah. Is, you know, like illustrations going back for so long, like dark eyes mm-hmm. are Ooh. supposed to be scary. Ugh. Or historically, now, yeah. Scare me. Anyways. Uh, you ready to move on now? Away from black-eyed children? Oh, thank God. Okay, let's, let's uh, move towards another dark entity, some shadow people. This story is a longer one centered around an interesting thought. If a demonic spirit can be exercised... When it's exercised, where does it go? Does it stay near the person or people who were just exercised of the spirit or the place? And if so, can it then quickly find a new host? Probably. That's what I was, that's what I was mentioning, that demonic transference uh, earlier. So quick note about this story. It has been told by numerous YouTubers and podcasters. It's been written about in a few places, even featured on an episode of the Sci-Fi Channel's Paranormal Witness Show, Season 3, Episode 17, The Visitors. Some of the details fluctuate from telling to telling. I'm basing this on an interview that Bill, the center of this story, gave himself in the summer of 2020, after a lot of this other stuff already came out, on the Spirit Talk podcast. Kind of a little-known podcast. I don't even know if it exists on third-party players. It might just be on their website. Oh, okay. And he gave like this two-hour interview, uh, and Bill corrected some of the inconsistencies of previous tellings. Okay, great. So so it's coming direct from the source. All right, let's hear it. So if you're like, you know, wait, I thought I heard you went in that house, or I thought he said this instead of that, or did this. That's why this telling is a little bit different. <laughs> uh, so, okay, before he had any experience with the paranormal, Bill Vale thought he understood the world. He thought that what you can see, what you can scientifically test and examine, he thought that's all there was. He'd had many jobs over the years, all of which involved technology or engineering in some way. He spent his first 10 years uh, of his working career in the U.S. Navy, working primarily on nuclear submarines. To get a job on a fast ta- attack nuclear sub, You have to undergo rigorous testing, including a lot of psychological testing to make sure that you're calm under pressure, rational, you know, basically sound of mind. And he went through all that. Interesting background for someone who will go on to claim, you know, what he has claimed. After the military, he worked in the aerospace industry, even working for NASA at one point as a robotics engineer. And then back in 2002, he went through a divorce and he took a pause and reevaluated his life. He didn't want to work in the aerospace industry anymore. Great money, but he was sick and tired of the stress that went along with the kinds of jobs he was working. He was tired of the long hours as well. He went through a, you know, a midlife crisis of sorts. And while trying to figure out what to do with the rest of his life, he moved back home to Arlington, Texas, where his little brother Bob and other family lived. He took a job working as a water and air purification systems technician for a company his brother owned. Better hours, less stress, and he get to be outside a fair amount. 
He bought a house. He started living there by himself. Life was good again. He liked his new job. He liked his new house. He enjoyed living back in Arlington. And then that damn call came in. And soon after it did, life got scary. Time now for the tale of the House of Shadows. It was late one Saturday afternoon. Bill and Bob were about to pack it up for the day. And then just as they were getting ready to leave, an appointment came in. The person making the call was adamant that the technician show up exactly at 5 p.m., not a minute before or later. Bill thought it was weird that they were so specific about the time, but whatever, some people are weird. He told his brother he'd take the call, and then he got into his car with his equipment set out for the address that the caller had given him. Bill had just pulled up to the house and was gathering some supplies to take into it when he heard something. It sounded like a scream, a blood-curdling scream. Bill suddenly had the urge to leave, to go and not look back, maybe call the police, but he reminded himself to be rational. Maybe someone had seen a wasp, a spider, a mouse in the house, who knows, anything. So he approached the home. As he walked up through the window, he could see a woman standing up with several people seeming to kneel at her feet. The woman raised her hand, shouted something. Bill couldn't quite make out what it was at first. But then as she continued to shout, he heard her shout phrases like, Get out! Leave these people in the name of Jesus Christ! Then the woman started shrieking, her voice rising into a blood-chilling wail, her body convulsing, shaking as she stood. Obvious, she was the woman he'd heard scream before, and she wasn't the only one making noise. He could hear the people kneeling beneath her, mumbling, maybe chanting something he couldn't understand. Bill was freaked out, but he was still there to do a job. So despite his wariness, he walked up onto the porch and rang the doorbell. Oh my God. When he rang the doorbell, the people in the house immediately grew quiet. He rang it several more times. Then a sweaty woman answered, the woman he'd seen standing, and instead of greeting Bill, she just gave him a vacant, blank, and uncomfortable stare. Bill didn't like the way she looked at him, how it made him feel. Something was off with this lady. Then after a few very awkward moments, without saying a word to Bill, she just slowly shut the door in his face and then refused to answer it after that. Bill, confused, trying to process the entirety of the scene he had just stumbled upon and become part of for a moment... After realizing they were not going to come to the door again, he backed away from the door, got into his car, and drove away confused. He put a call into his brother's office, explained what had just happened, told them, that, told them that if that house were to ever need any service in the future, he would not be the tech that was going to help them. Very strange and surreal experience. Even though Bill never did enter that house that day, he would later come to believe that something from that house entered him. Soon after that visit, Bill began to experience strange poltergeist-like activity in his home. He began to hear scratching, knocking sounds coming from inside the walls on a semi-regular basis. Dishes rattling in the kitchen cupboards. He would hear what sounded like doors opening, closing in rooms no one was in. A lifelong skeptic, Bill kept trying to rationalize what was happening to him as being entirely explainable. He looked into a possible mice infestation, tried to figure out if nearby traffic or maybe some small earthquakes were behind some of the new rattling and noises, but none of that checked out. It didn't explain anything. Certainly didn't explain the way all of this was making him feel. Finally, he decided that there just wasn't a reasonable scientific explanation for what was happening. And he'd later say that once he truly accepted the strong possibility that something paranormal was in fact going on, it was like a door that had previously just been barely cracked, now suddenly swung wide open. Things escalated quickly and dramatically. Actual figures he will later come to believe are possibly demonic began to show up. Fuck. Strange little shadow people, small figures at first, both seen and felt, at first just seen in his peripheral vision. On the evening of the day, he decided that something paranormal was likely going on. When Bill was fixing himself something to eat and watching a little television, he swore he saw something move just out of his line of vision. Just movement, something small and dark. Bill would come to call these smaller figures watchers later. Little dark masses that seemed to primarily just watch you, spy on you almost. Over the next few weeks, he kept occasionally seeing shadows darting around in his peripheral vision. Sometimes he'd go inspect the area he'd just seen the movement come from, hoping he'd find out that maybe it was a mouse or that perhaps a cat had suddenly gotten to his home, something understandable. Since he lived alone, some random animal getting in would be the only rational explanation. But of course, he never found anything. And he wasn't that surprised when he didn't. He was becoming more and more positive that paranormal entities had infested his home. 
He also began experiencing a sensation that when he'd walk into one of the rooms of his house, something else had just left. But he never found anything when he looked. Sometimes he did think he saw what seemed to be a small, shadowy entity fleeing as he came into the room, but he never got a solid look at it. And then one night, not long after all these sightings began, something much more tangible occurred. Bill had laid down in bed, was just about to drift off to sleep one night, when he felt it. It felt like something ran across his feet along the foot of his bed. He flicked on his bedside lamp, sat up in bed, but nothing was there. Searched his room, then searched the rest of the rooms of his house. Nothing. Uneasily, but knowing he had to be up early for work the next morning, he soon laid back down to get some rest, turned off the lamp, and Bill drifted back to sleep. Then suddenly he woke up to the bed violently shaking, as though he was experiencing an earthquake. His bed was not something that could be easily rattled. It was heavy enough that he could barely lift it himself. If not an earthquake, what could be causing this? He would realize soon that of course no earthquake had occurred, but he didn't really need to look online to know that. He knew deep down when it was happening that it was something else, something paranormal. Finally the bed stopped shaking and then all was quiet, too quiet. He got up and grabbed his laptop to try and find some breaking headline that might shed light on what had just happened. And right after he got online, his internet connection abruptly flickered off. So Bill called his service provider's 24-hour customer support number, and while he was on the phone, a demonic voice suddenly came over the line. My God. He couldn't quite make out what it was saying, but it filled him with dread. Making this experience a lot scarier, he wasn't the only person who heard it. The customer service representative he was talking to heard the voice as well. And when Bill asked him exactly what he'd heard, the man said he didn't want to talk about it, and then the line went dead. Then his internet was back on. And that was it for that night. A few nights later, after a few more days of hearing the sounds of scratching in the walls, knocking sounds, seeing things out of the corners of his eyes, generally feeling spied on and harassed all the time, something new happened again. A bottle of water came flying across the room while Bill was sitting down to eat dinner, nearly hit him in the face. He walked over to grab the bottle, and when he bent down to pick it up, it started rolling across the floor away from him on its own, and then the power went out and he was plunged into darkness. Oh, shit. Then he felt the presence of something in the room with him. Possibly several somethings, shadow figures, watching him. Bill now fumbled his way to the closet to grab a flashlight. As he stood by the open door, he could barely see in the darkness, and then he did see, just barely, a box lift up off one of the shelves, then crash down onto the floor in front of him. And it felt like a warning to Bill, but a warning of what? Did whatever was in Bill's house want him to leave? He didn't understand what to do. Bill wanted to talk to someone about what he was experiencing, but he didn't know if anyone would believe him. All Bill's friends were, like him, not religious, and they worked in tech and engineering. Logical, skeptical people. They'd think he'd gone crazy if he started talking about strange, possibly malevolent forces in his home. He got into bed, unable to sleep, stared up at the ceiling. What was he going to do? What could he do? And then he started to hear something shifting around. Something shifting around under his bed. Oh! It sounded like a person wiggling underneath the bed to try and grab something down there to hide. Or like someone who'd already been under the bed, now wiggling around to get out. Terrified, he didn't want to just stay in bed and wait for whatever was down there to find him. So he hopped off the mattress, was about to run out of the room when the unthinkable happened. Something shot out from under his bed, grabbed a hold of his ankle. Whatever grabbed him felt like a hand, but not like a human hand, too cold, too strong, more of a claw. Twisting his ankle, he was able to wrench out of its grasp. He ran out of the room, ran downstairs, grabbed his landline, placed a call to his brother Bob, and asked him to please come over. When Bob showed up, Bill described all the things he'd experienced and led Bob to the closet. Then when Bob opened the closet door where Bill had seen that box lift up on its own and then crash down, a box seemingly now flew off the shelf and hit Bob in the face. But Bob, extremely skeptical, like his brother used to be, someone who had not been harassed for months, who was not convinced that something unexplainable was going on, felt that his brother just needed to clean out his closet, get a little better organized. When nothing else happened that night, when he didn't hear scratching or knocking sounds, didn't see any shadowy entities sipping around in his peripheral vision, when it didn't feel like to him, like anything had just, uh, you know, left a room he'd walked into or was watching him, Bob then went back home. Bill now tried to get help from someone else, a friend named Michael Higdon, a sound engineer by trade. While they were on the phone talking about what Bill had been experiencing, the demonic voice spoke again. And again, Bob couldn't quite understand what it said. It was like it spoke in a language that he just didn't recognize. 
This time because Bob had told Michael about the experience hearing that voice when speaking to the internet provider, customer service representative, Michael had been recording the call. And when he played back the recording, he heard the demonic voice again. He saw the spiky waveform it made on the recording. But when he tried to play it back again, when he tried to zoom in and really isolate and analyze the sound, it was gone. It had impossibly disappeared. Michael Higdon was now a believer. He knew that Bill was dealing with something paranormal, but with no recording evidence, who else could they get to believe him? A few days later, with Bill still wondering how he was going to put an end to all of this, his brother Bob and Bob's wife Cindy came over to his house for dinner and a movie. And with witnesses now, a small shadowy figure made its most visible appearance yet. Not just seen out of the corner of Bill's eyes this time, he looked directly at it. As Bill sat in his favorite chair watching the movie, he sensed some movement, turned his head, and then could see a small pitch black figure run across the dining room. He quickly got Bob and Cindy's attention, both of whom were of course skeptical of his claims. Bill put the movie back on, asked them to keep their eyes on the dining room, and then the shadow creature came back. Both Bill and Cindy now claimed to see it. All three watched a small human shaped shadowy figure seem to run across the dining room. And extra creepy, though the figure was pitch black with no discernible features, no eyes, for example, they all agreed that the figure's attention had been fixed on them as it passed through the room. They all felt like it had been watching them before they saw it run. With his friend, brother, and sister-in-law's encouragement, Bill now contacted a team of paranormal investigators to come check out his home. They were to, uh, they came over after just, after just a few days. Uh, there was just a few days more of you know light activity, more fear for Bill. Uh, the first thing the team did when they got there was to check for natural causes. Setting up some cameras, they set up a laser grid so that if anything moved, like an animal of some kind, they would see the break in the laser beam. And they'd hopefully have whatever you know broke the beam captured on video as well. An hour or so after all setting all this up, one of the investigators prepared to head into the bedroom with an EVP monitor. And just as he was about to get up and leave, one of the lasers they had set up for the grid started to move on its own. They went over the footage, saw a mist gathering around the laser grid. And then when they reviewed the audio, the team distinctly heard voices. Put it back, he's coming. Followed by the sound of the laser hitting the floor. The team told Bill they now believed that multiple harmful spirits, possibly, if not very likely, demonic were in his home. That these spirits wanted to harass and harm him, that maybe they could do worse than harm him if he continued to stay. They recommended that Bill leave his house. But Bill had no interest in that. Oh, Bill. He told him he wanted to stay and fight back, that he was not going to be bullied out of his home. Is Bill a Darren, a glutton for paranormal punishment? Would I do the same thing? Am I a Darren? Later that night, the paranormal team left his house, and Bill felt the house shake so hard that he thought for a moment that a car had slammed into one of the walls. He ran outside, but there was no damage. Then as he stood on the lawn, he heard a crashing noise now come from inside the house, ran back in to investigate. When he made it to where he thought the noise had originated from, he didn't see any damage. Nothing that would explain the noise. Then he heard what sounded like another crash coming from somewhere else in the house. Then another, and another, and another, all seeming to come from just right outside his reach. And then, wah, 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 Bill's car alarm. He'd had the car for years and had literally never gone off before, ever. He knew it was the paranormal harassment he was experiencing. He was scared, but also furious now. He was sick of being harassed in his new home. He screamed in frustration that he was going to send the creature that did it back to hell. He charged upstairs to his bedroom to regroup, think about what his next move should be. As he marched up, he felt the temperature rising in his house dramatically. Sweat suddenly sticking to his skin. He heard laughter coming from all around him. Angry, scared, confused, he called the leader of the investigative team that had just left. And when they answered, all Bill could hear was the demonic voice. But this time, it didn't sound like it was coming from inside the phone line. It sounded like it was coming from somewhere in the bedroom near him. Bill slowly looked around and then saw a dark creature standing at the foot of his bed, not one of the smaller entities he'd seen before. Roughly six feet tall, pitch black, humanoid, but not quite the right shape to be human, too elongated somehow, like a human whose body had been stretched and warped. And it was staring at him and now coming towards him. As he stood frozen in fear, not knowing what to do, it came closer and closer, seeming to hover just above the floor as it floated towards him, bringing with it a smothering sense of despair. And then just before it seemed like it was going to touch him or attack him, it faded into nothing and he heard the laughter again. Suddenly downstairs, the front door began to violently rattle. Bill had no interest in going down to investigate. 
He left the lights on that night, and he barely slept. And then he was further terrorized in the days that followed. He claims he was physically attacked, scratched, hit by shadowy entities that always seemed nearby. Bill now began doing a lot of research into shadow people, and he came to believe that when he'd approached that house where he'd heard those screams, heard the woman yelling, get out, he'd walked into some kind of exorcism, some kind of unsanctioned exorcism, maybe some type of demonic transference. Bill now started to think that the woman who had called him there had called him there for that specific horrible purpose, that she wanted a stranger to take whatever kind of demonic presence was afflicting one or more of the people kneeling before her and give it to him so he could take it away uh, so it would stop attacking whoever it was attacking before. He now believed he'd gone to that house alone, but hadn't left that way. And whatever he'd brought back was now living in his house. He'd left with something that was hell-bent on tormenting him, something that wanted to drive him mad, something that wanted to destroy him. But still, he refused to leave his home. Instead, he claims he found God. He claims that research into demonic forces led him to the Bible. He took the verse about fearing no evil to heart, and then he became a born-again Christian. And he began to believe that if he had enough faith in the Christian God, that God would protect him, and the spirits in his house would not be able to ever really harm him, and that he had no reason then to fear them. He did have his house exercised two different occasions, but it didn't help anything. He said the attacks that began so many years ago have continued, and he's saying this just last year in 2020, but he claims he's not afraid. He says he fir firmly believes that these things can only hurt him if he allows them to if his faith weakens. And if they can't hurt them, he has no reason to really fear them. So he continues to live alone in this house of shadows. He may live with them for a long time. He says he will not try to sell the home for as long as the activity remains because he doesn't want to put anyone else through what he's been dealing with for almost two decades now. That is ultimate Darren. <laughs> I know if we are going to believe like Darren's that way. I mean, I do. I mean, noble if he's being totally honest about all this. I mean, there's nobility to that. Like, I don't want to let anybody else suffer through this. But also, it's like, um, I mean, just to accept, you're just going to be tormented. I mean, maybe he believes that if he left, it would it, they would follow him. I don't know. But then, if they were going to follow him, then why not just get rid of the house? I don't know. I don't know because it also doesn't sound like it's happening anywhere except at the house. Yeah. So theoretically, if they're following him, like, why isn't he also being harassed all day long? Oh, yeah. Why isn't he being harassed in other places? Mm -hmm. uh, listening to him, he seems a little Darren-ish. I mean, to me, that yeah. ending, I was yeah. like, oh, my gosh. But then that ending, I'm like, you jackass. You're just doing this for attention now. Mm. You saw how much attention it got you. I'm not right. saying that it didn't right. or wasn't right, didn't happen. Wasn't happening or isn't happening. That's interesting. But it's like, oh, okay. I know I can spin yeah. this. I can spin this. Because now, listen to me talk about how I'm so cool. And well, I I am going mm -hmm. to be, the, I'm going to do the thing that no one else has done. I'm going to stay and I'm going to fight it and I'm going to act like it's not yeah. bothering me. Bullshit. How's your mental health, Bill? I know after the exposure, I will say from the sci-fi you know, show, mm -hmm. it, it, it does seem like he really became far more involved in the paranormal community. Yeah. So, because it, it, that definitely could be a possibility where all of a sudden you get some attention Mm -hmm. You know, um, you like the attention it gets you. You sure. are, you are dealing with things. Uh, yeah, I, it's, I mean, it's but now you're like, mm -hmm, now that's like part of your identity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I, which is, if we're gonna, you know, uh, throw out the term Darren, that is that is pretty Darren esque. That is the ultimate Darren. And if, and if you're a new listener, Darren is just somebody who just uh, you know knows they're being attacked by some paranormal forces, and then rather than try to remove themselves from the attacks or you know get away from it or have it cleansed or you know expelled whatever mm -hmm. exercise. They just kind of embrace it, and yeah. they just like become a needless glutton for paranormal punishment. Who is that other guy? Remember, it was not that long ago. <sighs> oh, that was on a bonus episode, so not everyone will have heard that. Yeah, but, but it was a guy in Seattle, and I cannot remember his name. Yeah, the Seattle guy. I can't mm -hmm. remember John. No, I can't think of it. And either. he and he was a guy that the Zach Baggins team like ended up referring to later as like this guy's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I just feel like all those guys could get together <laughs> and have their own little party. Um, yeah, I mean, I just. Even, hmm, how do I want to say this? Even if you're someone who's incredibly skeptical, mm -hmm. uh, you only have, we, we're human. You can only take so much of anything. Mm -hmm. So how has this not broken him? And is it because it's no longer happening? Mm -hmm. Because while I'm not religious, I'm, I mean, hello, I'm holding a cross. When I get super scared, yeah, I don't suddenly start praying, but I do just think about like good and evil. I don't see it as like Catholic, Jewish. Yeah. I just see it as a different kind of, thing spiritual he, so it's like i just find it really interesting that he thinks that his faith in god mm -hmm. is what's going to keep him 
safe. And and for someone who was proclaimed so cynical mm-hmm. and like science, yeah, science, yeah. science, science, I have a hard time believing that he actually is truly religious. Oh, I think he is. Uh, that I have you ever met? So, oh, well, you have. Uh, we don't uh, have to throw out names, uh-huh. but like, yeah, but like the 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 when they're first born again, like the real kind of arrogance mm-hmm. that can come with that. Mm-hmm. He has so much of that in this most recent uh, interview. Okay, and, and it and it. Feels like the spin he has on it now is that he's proving that he is such a good Christian mm-hmm. and he has so much unwavering faith. Oh no, I get that. With this thing, but it reminds me of like a um, a tent revival style, like preacher, mm-hmm. you know, like that kind of thing where it's like it's funny that that pride is a sin. Yeah. But they kind of like forget that part and become like so prideful. I know. I'm the best Christian. I'm the most that's devout. What I think maybe or, or devout. I'm, I'm devout. Maybe <laughs> I'm not making. My point clear is like oh. I don't actually think he believes all of that. I think it's all part of his act. Ah, okay. And and I think that about all people who mm. are that way, where it's mm. like bullshit. You are putting on a show, and whether it is conscious or subconscious, somewhere in you, you know that you're putting on a show. Look, I am holier than that. Yeah. I am better than you because the real Christians, yeah. like people like my mom, mm. are never like that. You know what's interesting is like as you as you know you know I'm not religious, but I am like a kind of a biblical scholar. Yeah. And uh, in the book of Matthew, I can't remember like the verse, but they're, I'm 99% sure it's Matthew, is uh, this verse about like, you're not supposed to basically pray in public. It's, oh. it's supposed to be a private relationship with God. Is that part of and the same thing where it's like- it's ignored um, by some people. Uh, I don't know if it's in the book of Matthew, but it's like, uh, we would talk about it a lot, like around Lent, like you're supposed mm. to fast, but complain not. Right. You know, like just because you're not you're... doing it for show. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is something that is so often forgotten mm-hmm. because we certainly have enough friends in our lives that are religious. Yeah. That I, I mean, I never even think about it. I'm never with them thinking like, oh, I'm being judged right now. I'm like, yeah. no, you're a person. I'm a person. We believe different things, but you don't have any less respect or, you know, um, I don't have any less respect for you. Yeah, so so yeah. when people act like mm-hmm, this, mm-hmm. it makes me so angry because True. I think and on a whole, it gives religion a bad name right. and I just don't fucking buy it with this guy. Yeah, I, I, I get just that. don't buy it. I do think that the things were happening Yeah, and then I don't think that he concocted that whole thing yeah i mean if he did wow that's impressive mm, but yeah the fact that like the brother saw it the sister-in-law saw it you know i think there is definitely something happened mm-hmm. but then he just took it to a whole other level mm-hmm. and and i also don't like what that means for the paranormal community because if they find out that this guy you know it went away mm-hmm. or whatever and and now it just makes them all look a little farcy mm, i see yeah yeah okay <laughs> uh a few pictures okay this first one is Bill from 2013. Okay, hi Bill. And then this next one is not a picture of Bill's shadow person, but you know, it's just like this is the kind of figure he seems to have claimed to witness. See, like you can oh, just see God. a little bit darker than the dark around it. I can't. Yeah. Is that what you saw in our bedroom? Ah, uh, I was no. It didn't have like that much shape. It just seemed like extra dark. Oh, okay. But I, but I will say it didn't seem to have a. I don't remember. It's like a humanoid shape. Great. I love that. That's a lot of relief. Is it gone? Yeah. Okay. No. Oh, yeah, it's gone now. And then this is just a funny shadow uh, kind of person meme or shadow meme, I guess, from Reddit. I came across looking for um, more shadow people images. This, uh, it says, uh, this is the only picture uh, my husband took during our two-day trip to the ocean with our three kids. <laughs> <laughs> and I just so strongly related to it. It's just a guy looking in the water. Water. There's some kind of like rock or sea anemone. There's some like little like black bushy creature. And he just lined his shadow up so it looks like it's pubic hair. That is, and that's the only picture he took on their vacation. I'm like, that's such a dad move. That's such a, that's such a Dan Cummins move. <laughs> and you would be so proud of yourself. Oh yeah. Oh mm-hmm. yeah. You're proud for this. I'm guy. proud for this guy. That's funny. <laughs> that that's funny. Um, uh, and I, I had some Bill. notes, but I think we covered them. Okay. Oh, you you yeah. got it all. Yeah. You got yeah. it all. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Bring it. Oh yeah. At the beginning, mm-hmm. what I thought was interesting, actually, just to kind of tie it all up, he had this theory that if he didn't acknowledge it. It, it wouldn't be real or it would go away or it wouldn't go further. Yeah. He said once you opened up his mind to the, yeah. that it was. And that was before he had a conversion. No, I know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then yeah. it got like much more powerful. I saw you making notes at that point. Yeah, because it was just like I remember that from last week or two weeks ago from the fan. St- I think it was last week from a fan. I believe it was Guillermo. He also – it was like the he, the brother – he thought it, he thought it was his brother walking mm-hmm. down the hall. The thing oh, that yes, like yes, yes. nodded at him or whatever acknowledged him, but the then possible doppelganger, yeah. maybe not, but possibly, yeah, or, or just a shadow person. Mm-hmm. It, not doppelganger because it didn't 
It was just a shape. It didn't necessarily oh, right. It didn't have features. Right. Yeah, it wasn't a, yeah. a duplicate or a twin, if you will. Yeah. It was just a shadow. But uh, he said he saw it, and then he went back to bed because he's like, "Well, if you don't acknowledge it." You know, <laughs> right, right. And I think that there is some truth to that. You know, it's like when you have an mm-hmm. ache or pain in your body, the yeah, you might not feel good, but the more attention you give it, yeah. somehow the worse it gets. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, so I just, yeah, I'm, Bill, Bill is not on my list of favorite people. <laughs> okay. Fair. Bill, you're out. Uh, okay. So I'm going to do my part of the show now. Okay. All right. <laughs> but before I do my part, yeah, I want to talk about this. The book. The book. Okay, so for anyone who was lucky enough to get one of the pre-order first thousand autographed books, this is the box it's going to come in. It so is cool. so beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's really cool. Your shipping label will be here on the back. That's what that's about. But these are really beautiful boxes Logan designed. Mm-hmm. And then today, a very fun thing happened. Um, the prototype Ooh. showed up. So this is not bound, but yeah. this is... This is it. Ah, oh, it looks cool. And, I mean, look how thick that baby is. That mm-hmm. is a juicy tail. Um, and then, you know, it's got all the... I don't want to oh, open cool. it because it's, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. glued. But, I mean, that's a lot of book. Super cool. Yeah. So, and then I, with that, I wanted to give a tiny, tiny update. I was speaking to the publishing house, the, the printers, and they are a few days delayed, which we anticipated. Mm-hmm. So You said you built a cushion in for that? Built a cushion in for that, and then they built a cushion in, so it still looks like the books are going to arrive. Instead of arriving like, you know, the 1st of October, they might arrive like the 5th of October, and we're still going to get them signed yeah. and everything out. It looks like on time, you'll have them before Halloween. Yay. If you pre-ordered. Yeah. If you pre-ordered. I just mm-hmm. want to say that. I mean, that was the only way to get them right now, but... Yeah. Um, oh... That sweet, sweet baby. So <laughs> awesome. proud of that. Okay. Are you ready to go to Asia? I'm ready. Okay. I got my cool little black Layla here, squishy. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. For the love of God, I'm so mad. The girl that gave them to us is from mm-hmm. the Cleveland show. You had the red Layla last week because mm-hmm. she sent brown, black, and red Layla. I have to find that message from her because, she, again, she gave them the funniest names. And it was just like Bob and Susan or something. Oh, like cute. They were so silly. Anyways. Well, thank you, Cleveland, Cleveland fan. You know who you are. Okay. Um, I do want to say this story is a little bit sad as okay. well. It's just okay. like a little like womp womp, okay. but super freaked me out. Um, do you think that you would rather see a ghost, because I know how you feel about water sometimes, would you rather see a ghost or figure or whatever just roaming around our house or underwater? Like mm. you're swimming, you dive into the lake. Do you want to see something there? Well, both choices suck, but maybe randomly, maybe in our house, because then I don't get to go in the water. Then, then I'm so scared of the water in general right, right. that it ruins just water related activities for me. And then in the house, yes, that sucks, mm-hmm. but I'm not as worried about it. Like, because it can't drown me. Exactly. I don't want it to drown me. Exactly. Mm-hmm. This is like a whole new Is We Dumb segment. I know. I was just thinking, like, reminding me of the start off of, uh, yeah, Is We Dumb. I know. I want. This is a terrible would you rather. I know. It really, really is. Well, I also had that same feeling because I thought, like, the thing about water is that your eyes play tricks on you. I mean, mm-hmm. that happens anyways, but there is, you know, there is stuff under the water. There are fish and seaweed yeah. and litter and, you know, all the things that just kind of, and people have died in the lake here. So it's like, ha. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they can't always retrieve the body. It takes them weeks, mm-hmm. if not months, to find them because the silt on the bottom. So yeah. I've, I would like see that. I, I would be ruined for life. Ah, well, let's find out what happens to Madeline. Hello, Scared to Death crew. My name is Madeline. I believe that a time-traveling ghost may have saved my life. For privacy reasons and out of respect for others involved, the locations, names, and names of people will not be disclosed. Let me begin this story by saying that prior to this experience, I had never, ever believed in anything supernatural. A few years ago, however, that changed. On spring break of our senior year of high school, my boyfriend and I of three years embarked on a trip from America to Southern Asia. Most of his family lived over there and were more than happy to let us stay with them on our eight-day vacation. This boyfriend was my first love, (laughs) and despite our age, we were very serious, and that is why our parents were all right with us traveling around the world on our own. On the third day of our trip, after a couple amazing days in Asia, my boyfriend and I decided to visit an abandoned mine slash quarry that was popular amongst the locals. 
It had been abandoned for about 50 years and had been used more recently as a swimming hole for teenagers and rowdy college students. The first thing I noticed upon arriving at the quarry was how truly beautiful it was. Surprisingly clear water, lush trees, and a gorgeous view of surrounding mountains. That view will always be burned into my mind. There were a decent amount of people at the quarry already, a few groups of college-aged people as well as some middle-aged men. Fast forward an hour or so, my boyfriend and I were having so much fun. There were rocks and cliffs you could jump off of, and the water was the perfect temperature. We had just finished a nice picnic lunch that his aunt had prepared for us, and I wanted to try jumping off the largest cliff there. My boyfriend was scared of heights, so he didn't want to jump himself, but he followed me up there anyways to make sure I was safe. After a quick kiss, I stood laughing at the edge of the cliff, adrenaline pumping through my veins. Count me down, babe! I chuckled. Three, two, one, he called. I jumped, screaming as I plummeted a hundred feet into the water below. Underneath the surface, I felt amazing. I wanted to jump again and maybe try to convince my boyfriend to do it with me this time. I began kicking up and was about to surface when something grabbed my left ankle Uh. and yanked me down. I started to kick harder, 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 panic setting in as I was dragged deeper. I couldn't see what had a hold of me. The water was too dark down there. My ankle was released after a few moments and I frantically began swimming to the surface again. I could see the light far above me, but before I could get anywhere, something else grabbed my wrist. What? Whatever it was was so cold, like a frozen handcuff securing me in place. My lungs began to ache, and I was surprised I hadn't passed out already. Just then, something, someone, appeared in front of my eyes. Someone with a ghastly face glowing a hazy white. When I opened my mouth to scream, a freezing cold hand was placed over my mouth, sealing in my voice. That was when I realized the face in front of me looked familiar. It looked exactly like my boyfriend. The only real difference was there was a deep, circular gash in the middle of its forehead. Black liquid spilling from the gash, floating lazily upwards in the water. Once I made eye contact with my boyfriend, who who obviously wasn't my boyfriend, I found it impossible to look away. My aching lungs were forgotten, its hand still firmly covering my mouth, the other wrapped around my wrist. I thought it was a ghost. It certainly looked like one, but for some reason, I wasn't afraid. Maybe because it had the appearance of someone I loved, or maybe it was just its energy. It was so kind, and I just knew it wasn't going to hurt me. In hindsight, I should have been freaking out. I was being held underwater by a ghost? I should have been worried that my real boyfriend might think that I had drowned. And why did this apparition look like my boyfriend? Why was it preventing me from swimming up? But all I could feel was pure calm. Suddenly, a voice, my boyfriend's voice, sounded as clear as day in my ears. Go the voice said, and finally the ghost released me. I instantly began kicking to the surface, and when I broke through the water, I gasped for air. My lungs were on fire, and I was shaking. Immediately, I noticed something else was deeply wrong. The quarry was too quiet, and every person I saw was lying on the ground, unmoving. What? Confused, I pulled myself to the shore and noticed a coppery smell in the air, the smell of blood. All the people at the quarry were bleeding. They were dead. I screamed my boyfriend's name over and over, choking on sobs. I looked at their bodies as I passed them, searching for my boyfriend and feeling sick. When I finally found him, I threw up. He was lying below the cliff I had jumped off of, head turned towards the water and eyes open. There was a bullet hole in the middle of his forehead. Later, I found out that one of the older men I had passed at the quarry had tried to shoot everyone present. I found out that a lot of people escaped into the woods and were physically unharmed. My boyfriend and a few others were not so lucky. My parents rushed out from the States to take me home, and almost right after that, they entered me into therapy. I was suffering from survivor's guilt as well as PTSD from losing my boyfriend in such a tragic way. I only told my therapist what I had seen under the water that day, and she insists it never happened. That my experience underneath the water was a scenario my brain concocted to help me deal with the trauma but I know what I saw. I know what I felt. For weeks after the incident, I had a purple bruise and sensitive skin on my ankle and my wrist, and I had a rash over my mouth that suspiciously looked like a hand. I am fully convinced that whatever held me under the water was the ghost of my boyfriend appearing a minute before the shooting to save my life. It has been a few years since this happened, and I have never been back to Southern Asia again. 
I'm not even sure if teenagers still use that quarry for swimming. I am sure, though, that I would not be writing this story today if the spirit of my boyfriend had not protected me. I'm engaged now, but still think of my old boyfriend often. Every time I enter a body of water, my ankle, wrist, and mouth tingle, as if my old boyfriend is reminding me that he's still with me and that he will keep me safe. Madeline. What? So, his some entity before he died? I don't know. Like, I mean, because it sounds simultaneous almost, right? right? right. Like, she jumps off the cliff and then this shooting happens? Did she uh, send any link to these uh, articles on this or anything? No. Just curious. Yeah, if there's more details. Man, that's a, that's a, yeah, I did not see that twist coming at all. No. I, I was no, worried. No, why would you? Well, yeah, why would, yeah, I was worried that her boyfriend uh, like drowned. Like, oh. like I thought like maybe he jumped in, bashed his head, and then somehow right afterward his spirit was like trying to let her know slash maybe help her. I was, or, or I thought like maybe somebody had drowned there before mm. and they were just like wanted to let her know like kind of like what they felt. I don't know, just some yeah. spirit reaching out. Yeah, we've had that before with water. Right, yeah. right. But man, that's a wild ass story. I know. My theory on it Oh my God. closely echoes yours and just that like if she jumped in and then like she's underwater and then the shooting is taking place, somehow his spirit left his body just long enough if the shooter was still active to keep, to keep her, her underwater under. yeah. so that she wasn't shot. Right, right, right. Because she gives no details about like how the shooter was apprehended or what made it stop. But like, what? of course, when she, um, you know, comes up from the water. Yeah. The shooting has stopped. So, and you know that this could have only been, what, 30 seconds, a minute mm -hmm. at most, because really how long can someone hold their breath underwater who's not trained to right, do that? Right, 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 before they just drown, yeah. That's a fascinating story. I know, I know, and I know it's sad. I was, like, hesitant to share it because it's a bit violent, but wow. Mm-hmm. Yeek. Crazy. I wonder if that's, like, a real thing that spirits can do that we haven't really explored here. If... If you and I are in a car accident, because people have talked about this, like being in a car mm -hmm. accident with somebody else and the other person doesn't make it in the end. But for a moment, it's like you saw their spirit rise up out of their body and like somehow protect you or right. turn the wheel a certain way to, you know, keep other people safe. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah, yeah it's fascinating to think about. It really is. Mm -hmm. Like what kind of power do you have in those moments immediately after death. And would it be more intense? Would it fade in t with time? Would, would you right. have more power? Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? We don't know the rules on uh, that side. I mean, weird to say, like, I like that story. Obviously, I didn't like what happened to her of or course. what she's talking about, but that was a very interesting story. Yeah, I really like it because it does... Oh, this is going to sound terrible. It gives me some weird piece of hope inside of me where, mm. like, if something awful happened... In, in a familial situation where, like, I have died, but I can protect my family somehow. I can mm -hmm. keep them safe. Mm -hmm. Or just anyone, for that matter. I mean, like, I would be happy to save the life of any person. I mean, that's kind of cool. That is cool. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, are you ready for something far more sinister? Yes. Okay, great. So the basement situation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you feel about our basement these days? Uh, I mean, I would say pretty good, but I haven't had any interest, uh, any need or desire. Like we've just been busier or whatever, just going a bit. I mean, haven't haven't been going down there. Hmm. Like no no situations come up where I where I would be testing how I feel. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Our basement in my house growing up was a half unfinished basement, and it was always just so dark, so mm -hmm. so dark. There were only like two or three windows, and there are those um, like not cinder block, but those. Um, big, thick block windows, you know, that mm -hmm. are pretty traditional in basements. And I, every time I would go down the stairs, it could be the middle of the day. Yeah. It could be two o'clock in the morning. I would haul ass up the stairs uh, out of right, the basement. Right, yeah. Every time. And there was like a switch at the bottom of the stairs uh. and at the top. So I could leave the hallway light on, but it was just, the light was at the top of the stairs. So it was just dark enough at the bottom. Yeah. Even though I could leave it on from the bottom, like, Oh, ah. it was just enough. Well, this... Be before before you tell this, sorry, otherwise I'll forget. No, tell me. You think this is funny? This is not scary, but it was okay. last night. Yeah. Because I was just thinking about how, like, I haven't got up to use the bathroom the last couple of days, just because I've been um, started working out again more, and I think I've just been so tired. I, I was zonked last night. That I just night. sleep hard through the night. But I did um, wake up. The dogs were making me so hot last night. Yeah. 
and I, and I just woke up a few times, had to like take the covers off because mm-hmm. they're like, you know, they pin me in and suffocate me. <laughs> yes. But uh, <laughs> I woke up to kicking Penny, like launching her off the bed last oh. night. She didn't yelp or anything, but I just like, as I'm waking up, I, I just like the blankets. I must've just been trying to rearrange my sleep and couldn't move. And so I just like pushed my leg, get the blanket and off goes the dog. <laughs> And then comes comes back. She came back on right away. Penny poops. And then I forgot that like when Kyler and I were watching that Neil Breen terrible movie, but you know, so bad it's good. Yeah. Penny was coming back and forth from the little guest bedroom to jump up and hang out with us. Yeah. And he just happened to like move his leg at the at the worst time for Penny. Perfect time for this to happen. He, he just pushed his leg out as she was jumping up. <gasps> so she went to jump up on the bed and immediately got launched back up off the bed. Oh. So she got kicked Did off the bed yell? twice. Nope. Okay. Nope. She she was happy and jumped back. She's like, whoop, whoop. But she got launched twice yesterday. Poor baby. She's like a bouncy ball. Boop, boop. Right, boop, right. Boop. Oh. Yeah, you did, a weird, you did your weird sleep thing last night where you end up on your back with your knees up. Oh, weird. I, I, like, I just don't understand how that could be comfortable. I don't know. I don't remember ever doing it. No, it's, it's bizarre every time. I feel like you're possessed. Okay. Well, let's get back to the basement. Okay, okay yeah. Here we go. Greetings, Dan and Lindsay. I'm a huge fan of both Time Suck and Scared to Death. Yay. As well as a longtime follower of Dan's comedy. What follows uh, What follows is the event that happened to me when I was about 16 years old. Hear, oh, and then he says, hear this. Ah, <laughs> references to the stand-up bit. That's awesome. The ghost in the basement. When I was 16, my parents had left me alone for a couple weeks while they went on a trip to Sturgis, South Dakota, for the annual motorcycle rally. My brother, I'm sorry, my older brother was out of town traveling for work, and my twin sister had elected to spend the time at a friend's house, leaving me home alone, to watch our dog, Casey, a very intelligent, half-black lab, half-border collie. The day my parents left, I had been at work. I worked evenings and weekends at the local grocery store. I left the house that morning wishing them a safe trip, knowing I wouldn't see them when I got home. When I returned home, I found the house locked and empty, as expected. My parents owned a ranch-style house located on the top of a small hill in rural Vermont, and I'm not and I'm not kidding, it's on Romance Lane. Funny. My brother and I shared a room in the basement, which was which had been finished off, leaving us with our own living room, and that detail will become important. Mm-hmm. After getting home, I took Casey for a walk and made myself some food. After eating, I went downstairs to grab some clean clothes to change into after my shower. At the bottom of the stairs, leading into the basement, there was an old root cellar that we used for storage. The old wooden door was very difficult to open as it would often get caught on the carpet in the living room. When I reached the bottom of the stairs, that old door was wide open and the light to the root cellar was on. I didn't think much of it as I assumed that my parents had taken some luggage out and had forgotten to close the door. So I shut it, grabbed my clothes, and went about my night. After a shower, I sat in our upstairs living room and played Xbox for a while on my parents' much larger and nicer TV. A few hours later, I went downstairs to go to bed and found the door to the root cellar wide open again. I got a little freaked out, but I thought maybe one of my friends had snuck in and was screwing with me. Not an unreasonable assumption. I shut the door, went upstairs, and made a few calls to my most likely suspects. All of them were either confirmed out of town or home with their families, and frankly, had better things to do than drive over to my house just to mess with me. So a little shaken, I went back downstairs to go to sleep and to check on that door. I had only been upstairs about 20 minutes max. When I got to the downstairs, when I got back downstairs, the door was wide open once again, and now the light was on. The basement, which was always cooler than the rest of the house, was cold. Colder than it had any right to be at that time of the year. It was late summer in Vermont, where it's usually 80 to 90 degrees with very high humidity. The basement was often a nice, ref- a nice refuge from the heat. But in this moment, it felt like winter in that room. It was frigid, and I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I shut the light off and shut the door again, and then went into our laundry room to where my father had a tool bench. I grabbed a very large, almost three foot long, flathead screwdriver pry bar tool and returned to the door. The door had one of those old slap latches for a padlock on it, so I slid the screwdriver into the latch and to keep the door shut. If anyone was inside, they'd be there till I opened the door again. And if anyone was in the house, I'd hear them moving the screwdriver as it was wedged in fairly tight. I then went to bed. A few hours later, I woke up at 5 a.m. The house was quiet, but Casey, who usually slept in my room when no one was home, was nowhere to be found. I got up to go to the bathroom and made my way into the basement living room on my way upstairs. The cellar door was wide open. 
The light was off. The room was colder now than it had been earlier, brutally so. The screwdriver was sitting on the coffee table, and that feeling of being watched was so strong. I took a couple tentative steps towards the door and felt a hand Ugh. grab my shoulder from behind so forcefully that I yelled in pain. I spun around to look at a dark, empty doorway leading back to my bedroom. I've never run up a flight of stairs so fast in my life. For the rest of the time my parents were away, I slept on the couch upstairs and refused to return to the basement. No other events happened during that time, but others would years later. I'm convinced that something resides in that house. I'm not sure if it's benevolent or malevolent, but it absolutely wants its presence known. Mike. Mike. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just um, <laughs> like I haven't had that experience happen to me. I don't think I don't think you have either where you have things moved around, obviously, right? No, no. Like just how unnerving that alone would be. Forget about the hand uh, grabbing your shoulder as you like try and walk up. Right. But just that thing of like you go downstairs, you clearly set some things, you know, here, here, and here. Yeah. And then you go up, and then later you come down, and they're all moved. And like doors that you knew were shut open, lights that you knew were off. I mean, like if you were just certain. That is, yeah, because it's so specific. <laughs> oh, and the, the the screwdriver, screwdriver. wedged in mm -hmm. like. And I like the detail about that the door is hard to open because it gets caught on the carpet. Right, so which makes it unlikely that like a breeze or whatever, graft exactly. or whatever. Even called. if it was yeah. like, you know, didn't have a great latch on, like if yeah. the latch was a little bit off as, you know, houses warp over time, it's like, mm -hmm. no, no, that should not have been happening. Uh-uh. And then after all that stuff to have the hand be like the little kicker. Oh my God. Because <laughs> oh that's God. the fear, right? I, would, I wouldn't go back down there either. That's the fear when you're running up yeah. the stairs that something Jesus. is going to grab you. Yeah. And it did. Blah. Mm-mm. Man, nope. that would be so intense. Monroe that would be was, so intense. Monroe was in the basement folding. Did you see something? No, I didn't. Oh, I thought cool. I did. Uh, Monroe was in the basement folding the boxes last night. Mm-hmm. And she left the light on when she went upstairs, which I'm like, oh, of course you did. You don't want to yeah. turn it off and come up she in the She goes dark. down. Her and Kyler do it in the basement. They don't care at all. Uh, they don't? I don't think so. They go so. down there. I go down there. But it's it's not the going down. It's the leaving. But they don't ever talk about being freaked out, But though. they leave the light on down there all oh, the time. Oh, they do. Yeah, true. Uh -huh. I'm like, they, okay. They don't leave in the dark, yeah. They sure don't. And so I had to, uh, the books are like in stacks. Mm -hmm. And so when, when there's a shadow and it's just dark enough, it looks like little. <laughs> little people. <laughs> little people. Little, you're like, what's that? What's that? Yeah. Ichi, Yeek. wow, wow. Lots of spooks today. I know. Yeah. What a great episode. So many scares. Uh, do you want to do your uh, Annabelle shout outs first oh, sure. or me? I would be happy to thank the following Annabelles for supporting us on Patreon. Kimberly Canavales, mm, Canazales, Tyranny Brits, Elena Maria Tusa, Rachel Kyle, Jared Own, Katie Sconfito, Sierra Dempsey, Jaron Morgan, Erica Kaiser, Kisser? Trina Carter, Casey Wakefield, Jennifer Murray, Long Dick Daddy from Cincinnati. <laughs> Funny. That was a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, Aaron uh, Cuvedo, Haley Elizabeth, Red Foreman, Nick uh, Wasmer, Ashley Jane C., Heather W., Kate Holworth. Oh, that makes me think of my gym teacher. I had a gym teacher with that last name. Huh. Jessica Scott, Daniel Lambert, Hello there, I'm Lauren, Jeanette Boltman, Donald Fee, and Thomas W. Larson Jr. <laughs> I like the full name, Thomas. Mm -hmm, I like it too. Uh, I would like to thank the following Annabelles, Jack Novak Zarate, uh, Stevie Goodenhow, Tyler Smith, Joseph Ryan, Mark Marot, Anna Pierre, Hannah Saturnos, uh, Jessica Ulmer, Andrew Brazano, Lord Piet, Christopher LeCount, Taylor Philman, Kelly Peters, Daniel Goh, Jennifer Martin, Cody Colbert, Daniel Strickler, Nick Ramirez, Sam Farrell, or Farrell, I think Farrell, Stephanie Dennison, Lindsay Paseca, Teresa Combs, Megan Gerard, Jessica Lewis, James Rodriguez, and then the first one might be Novak, Jack Novak, uh, Zarate or Zarate. Hmm. Uh, just haven't seen that last name before. How dare you? And then I know it is funny. Um, some people like uh, there was only one person actually. One person had this review like, oh, I can't believe they don't like 
how dare they basically like not get people's names right? Are you kidding me? And it's like like pronunciation. Even if pronunciation guides were sent, sometimes those people write them differently. Mm-hmm. I always feel better when I'm at the airport now that I'm traveling oh, again more. Yes. And you know, like uh, the people at the at the kiosk when they're calling people up to have their tickets verified John or whatever. John Smith, please report to mm-hmm. security mm-hmm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. And a lot, and then and then everyone smile. They'll be like John Smith, and then they'll be like uh, Jack, and then like long pause. <laughs> Kalakovit, Kalakovit, please report to. It's like, yeah, Yeah. names are hard. Names are hard. And also, (laughs) like, I have a crazy maiden last name. Mm, Radziminski. Yeah, which you cannot believe the things that I've heard. Oh, I bet when I if I were to, were to just see seen your name on paper, yeah. uh, Rad Radziminski, Radziminski. I mean, now I understand like just through you, like yeah. Polish names better and like the tendon, like the pronunciation tendencies they tend yeah. to have. But previous to that, I didn't. Yeah, there's no way I probably would have got that right. No way. Yeah, I remember learning how to spell it. I could hardly get it right. I even have my favorite is even on my name Cummins oh, or our name Cumin. Now. Yeah, Cumin, like the spice. But it never bothers me. But I'm like, oh yeah, I can see that Cummins. Lot, lots of coming. Cummins, like, dude. There's no G. The G. There's no G. But again, names are hard. I know. I know. So it's like whatever. Yeah, whatever. Whatever. If you're gonna get bent out of shape about it, it's never, never disrespectful. No. Yeah. We try. No. It's like it's not like we're here just like Bob, whatever the whatever. fuck your last name is. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Heather W. Okay. Like, Ooh. no, no. Come no. on. Come on. I have a few spooky shout outs okay. if you don't mind. Yeah. This, I love this. To Jesse from Renee, happy belated birthday to herself and happy <laughs> and happy birthday to Jesse. Funny. I thought it was so great. Mm-hmm. To Nick and Haley from Casey, happy wedding day. They're getting married on the 25th. You're almost Congrats. there. To Austin from Summer, happy belated birthday from your favorite sister. To Dominic from your mom, Barbara, happy 17th birthday. And to Summer from B, can't wait to watch you crush it at your new business. Awesome. So and many th- good things. And that's our show this week. Thank you for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else at info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks to Logan Keith on social media, badmagicmerch.com designs, store at badmagicproductions.com for customer service. Thanks to Joe Paisley for producing and directing today. Zach Cohen for custom sound bed creation. Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. And thanks to producer Sarah Finch for finding the two first Black Eyed Kid stories. And thanks to Sophie Evans for finding the third story today. If you don't want to hear more ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes and help donate to our charities and more, please check out our Patreon. Go to badmagicmerch.com for that October 28th Moment House Experience Halloween show we're doing. Yes, and don't forget to tune in, Annabelle's, for your TLA on Mm -hmm. on Sunday the 26th. And enjoy your nightmares, creeps and peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but has no home here within scared to death. Add magic productions. 